show, usually heard at this time, has moved to a new time period on Sunday nights. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Arman on the new Pet Milk Show, tomorrow night on NBC. And now, here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. <laughs> The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man's wife has suddenly dropped from sight. On the surface, it appears only as a routine missing persons case. You start to investigate. Suspicion grows. There is evidence of possible foul play. Your job, find the woman or find her murderer. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes... In cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, September 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from lunch, and it was 12.56 when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Waiting for you. Hiya, Ben. Al. Hi. I hear you got something for us. Uh, here's a report right here. A gardener by the name of Eric Kelby called in day before yesterday. He said his wife disappeared from their home out in the valley Sunday night. Says he thinks she left him. Well, that happens every day, Bargetti. Well, not this way, it doesn't. Uh, Walsh and I went out yesterday to interview the guy. Story doesn't add. Why not? Well, none of her clothes are missing. None of her luggage. She even left her pocketbook behind, full of money. Found out from the neighbors a missing woman is a 17-year-old boy by a former marriage. So what? An only child. Mother dotes on the kid. Shouldn't even say goodbye to him. How did this Jerry Kelby impress you? Pretty grouchy with Walsh and me. No cooperation. Wants to find his wife, doesn't he? I don't know if he does or not. It's no help, I'll tell you that. Can I see that report a minute now? Oh, here you are. Agnes Trumbull Kelby, age 39. Kelby's her second husband. The first one died a little after the boy was born. Mm -hmm. Disappeared Sunday night from her home, 546 Belasco Road, between 7 and 8 o'clock. When did Kelby call in? Monday afternoon. Said he thought his wife might be spending the night with her sister. When he found out she wasn't, he called us. Did you meet the boy while you were out there, Borghetti? Yeah, that's another thing. Kid came riding in on a bike while we were talking to one of the neighbors. Trying to talk to him, but the old man came out, hustled him inside the house. Then he starts eating us out. Hmm. What did he say? Told us it was our job to find his wife, not to go prying into his stepson's affairs. Well, that's a new slant. How about her friends and relatives around here, Al? Any besides his, her sister? Mm, Walsh located a couple of her aunts. I don't think he's checked them yet, though. I'll tell you, boys, this is one I'll bet on. Maybe. You got the names of Mrs. Kelby's relatives? Oh, yeah. They're yeah, right over here. I wish we had a chance to talk to that boy. Yeah. How's it feel to you, Ben? Mm, I don't know. Notice anything else funny about the guy, huh? Uh, I don't know. Now, here's those names, Joe. Thanks. Kelby was upset, all right. For some reason, he didn't strike me as reacting the way a normal guy reacts when his wife disappears. All right, Al. How would you react? Mm, Bargett is worrying again. Oh, now, listen, boys. It's no fooling matter. This is one I'll bet on. It's a homicide. All right. How about a copy of this report? Yeah, uh, where will I get the phone? Missing persons, Bargetti. Who's that? Oh. Uh, yes. Yes. About what? Oh, sure. All right, sir. Four o'clock. Yeah. Goodbye. That was Kelby's stepson. What do you want? Think something's happened to his mother. In police work, missing persons detail is not a department separate in itself. It is organized as a part of the Homicide Bureau. 
According to Bargetti, who took the call, the boy said he suspected his stepfather and he didn't want him to know of any meeting between him and the police officers. He would meet the officers that afternoon at 4 p.m. in a restaurant on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Fairfax Avenue. At 3.15, Ben and I left the office and drove out to the meeting place, the Dairyland Fountain and Coffee Shop. We arrived there at 3.45. At 8 minutes to 5, the Kelby boy still had not arrived. Youngster's not very prompt. Well, let's wait a little while longer. Yeah. Smoke? Yeah, thanks. Want some more coffee? No, thanks. Well, I guess the boy isn't going to show. Think something's happened? Fifteen minutes after we left the coffee shop, we drove up in front of the gate of the Kelby Nursery on Belasco Road. The house itself was set well back on the property, which covered about four acres. The entire nursery was surrounded by a six-foot steel wire fence. It looked like almost every available foot of ground inside was planted with some kind of a flower or shrub. Kelby met us at the gate. Yes? What do you men want? Police officers. Are you Mr. Kelby? Yes, what do you want? Well, if you'll shut those dogs up for a minute, we'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm busy now. Can't you come back tomorrow? Pretty important, Mr. Kelby. I think we'd better talk right now. All right, if you have to. Red, giant, down. You too, honey. Quiet. All right. Now, what do you want? Mind if we come inside? Well, these watchdogs of mine are pretty vicious. We can talk here at the gate. All right, Mr. Kelby. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We've been assigned to look into your wife's disappearance. Oh. Did you find anything yet? Nothing definite. Maybe you can help us. Would you tell us exactly what happened the night your wife disappeared? What do you mean, what happened? Well, when did you last see her? When did you first notice she was gone? We finished up Sunday night dinner about 7 o'clock, and I laid down for a nap. Agnes went out on the front porch for some air. I woke up a little before 8 and went outside to look for her. She was gone. Nobody saw her leave, Mr. Kelby? Not that I know of. Maybe some of our nosy neighbors, I don't know. How about your stepson? Wasn't he around Sunday night? Bruce? No. Went out to a show. Some other kids. When did he get back from the show? About 10, I think. Why? Where's your stepson now? Who are you looking for, my wife or my stepson? Both, Mr. Kelby. Where's your stepson? Gone. I took him over to my sister's in Alhambra. Been feeling bad since his mother disappeared. Figured the change would do him good. When did you take him over to your sister's, Kelby? This afternoon. What's that got to do with it? We'd like to talk to Bruce. No, no, I can't allow it. The boy's too upset. I can't allow it. I'm afraid you're going to have to allow it. Listen, mister, you can get off this property right now. No cops giving me sass. Nobody's giving you sass, Kelby. We want to talk to your stepson, that's all. You might give us a clue as to the whereabouts of your wife. And I say you can't see the boy. What's more, you cops couldn't find thorns in a rose patch. I'll get somebody else to look for Agnes. It's my business anyway. Nobody else's. It's our business, too, if anything's happened to her. What are you talking about? You better get your coat, Mr. Kelby. We're taking in for questioning. You come through that gate, and I'm going to let these dogs go accidentally. I'd hate to shoot the dog. Now go on in the house and get your coat. Eric Kelby turned and made his way up the path and into the house. Five minutes later, he came out. Without a word to either of us, he came down the path, closed the gate behind him, and got into our car. On the way back to headquarters, he chatted pleasantly about the weather, the nursery business, and his dog. When we pulled up in front of the city hall, we met the reason for his sudden change in temperament. His lawyer was waiting for us at the door. We took Kelby to one of the interrogation rooms. His lawyer tagged along. We tried to question him, but the lawyer objected to two out of every three questions we asked. It was hopeless, and we knew it. So did the lawyer. We released Kelby, but we did get the name and address of his sister where the stepson Bruce was staying. After they left, Ben and I got back in the car and drove out to Alhambra to check on the boy. Forget he had this and pegged right, Joe. It's a real sleeper. Yeah. I'd like to know how the stepson missed that date with us this afternoon. Well, if the kid called us from the house, his stepfather could have overheard him. It's possible. Sister's house ought to be along this block, shouldn't it? Yeah, let's see. 1408, 1406. All right, Joe, a great cottage, 1402. Right. That's a nice-looking little place, isn't it? Well kept. Yeah, it's a nice neighborhood. I wonder how the lot prices run out here. Somebody's coming. Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. Are you Miss Kelby? Bertha Kelby, yes, that's my name. Why? We talked to your brother earlier today, Miss Kelby. He said that you brought his stepson, Bruce, here to stay for a while. We'd like to see him. Bruce? Yes, he was here till about, oh, an hour and a half ago. I went to the store, and when I came back, he was gone. 
Have you any idea where he might be, Miss Gilbert? Well, I telephoned my brother Eric's place just before you came to the door. He's not there. I don't know where he might be. I'm worried about him. He seems so upset. It's business about his mother's disappearance, you know. Do you mind if we came in and looked around, Miss Kelby? Well, no, not at all. We went in and looked the house over from one end to the other. There wasn't a trace of the boy. We drove back to Kelby's nursery and satisfied ourselves the boy wasn't there. Then we came back to Alhambra and we kept an eye on Miss Bertha Kelby's home until midnight. No one came or went. At five minutes past midnight, the lights went off in the living room and a few minutes later in the back of the house. The next morning, when Ben and I checked in for work as usual at 8 o'clock, we met with Captain the Homicide, Frank Kearney. What makes you two so positive there has been any foul play in this Kelby thing? Must just it, Cap. We're not positive. It's a whole setup. It smells bad. For instance? That lawyer. If a man's innocent, he doesn't need a lawyer to sit with him in the interrogation room and tell him not to answer questions. Number two, that kid's telephone call. Maybe he doesn't get along with his stepfather. It happens, you know. Maybe he's trying to get back at him for something or other. Maybe. Then why is Kelby hiding him out? You sure he's hiding him out? No other way to take it, Cap. The Kelby woman walked away from her home Sunday night. Nobody saw her. She took nothing with her. No clothes, no luggage, no money. You checked with the family doctor. Yesterday. He told us Mrs. Kelby was in perfect health. We double-checked the wanderer's file and the repeater's file and missing persons. Couldn't find her name in either one. How about her relatives in town? Haven't had a chance to talk to them yet, Cap. We'll check them this morning. Well, one thing's certain. The woman couldn't have gone very far. We checked the sheriff's office, the jail, the hospital. Could have sent out a teletype and an APB. Every cop in the city has her description. She's been gone almost four days, but nobody's seen her. How does that add up to you? It doesn't. You better move on it. Check every one of Mrs. Calby's friends and relatives. Right, Frank. Then try the neighbors. As long as I've been a cop, neighbors have been able to tell everything about anyone. All that day, Ben and I made the rounds. First stop was the Western National Bank, where Mrs. Kelby maintained her account. Her savings statement showed a total balance of $31,564.17. Her separate checking account had a balance of $842.71. At the Farmer's Mutual, we found the record of an insurance policy issued to Agnes Trumbull Kelby. It was a 20-pay life policy covering the insured in the amount of $30,000. The beneficiary was listed as the insured son, Bruce Trumbull Kelby, if living upon the receipt of such due proof. If not, the insured's husband, Eric J. Kelby. <laughs> By the time we finished checking her financial status, the odds were piling up fast. From only casual reports, we knew that Eric Kelby was a frugal man. If he was greedy as well, if he wanted and needed money badly enough to kill, then he had all the motives necessary to murder his wife. Maybe his stepson, too. Ben and I started to make the rounds of Mrs. Kelby's friends and relatives. Our first stop was at the apartment of Agnes Kelby's sister, a talkative maiden lady in her early 60s. Agnes just isn't that kind. Oh, I'm worried sick about this. I really am. And Bruce, the poor lad, he must be heart sick. And Eric, what does Eric say about all this? He says he thinks his wife left him. Left him? Why, that's ridiculous. How strange. Can you think of any good reason why your sister would leave Mr. Kelby? I? Why, no. They had tiffs, of course, small ones. But, of course, there was that argument about Bruce. The two of them always seemed to be arguing about Bruce. How do you mean, ma'am? Oh, well, raising the boy and all, you know. Last time I talked to them, they were tipping about whether or not Bruce should be paid for working in the nursery for Eric. And the strangest thing, Eric seemed to be so upset about it all. Imagine. All on account of paying the boy a few dollars for good, honest work in that silly nursery. Well, you know, I'm the outspoken kind, and I just told Eric. Eric, I said, don't be an old meanie. Pay the boy. That was the extent of the information which Mrs. Kelby's sister had to offer. Next, we called on an aunt, a Mrs. James D. Trumbull, 83 years old. She could hardly understand our questions, let alone answer them. She hadn't seen her niece, Agnes, in a year. After that, we paid a visit to one of Mrs. Kelby's friends, a Mrs. Lillian Humboldt. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but I can't think of any good reason why she would leave him. Unless that silly business about Bruce got out of hand. You know, maybe Eric is just a little jealous of the boy. Next, we called on Daisy McLeod, who worked as a day maid for Mrs. Kelby. Officer, what Mr. and Mrs. Kelby thought, what they said, what they did, it's none of my business. I come in the morning, I do my work, I do it well. I'm not the nosy type and I don't try. I take half an hour for lunch and when I'm through, I take my pay and I don't expect tips and I take the bus home. I'm not the peeking through the keyhole kind, sneaking around corners listening. But what I couldn't tell you about that man. Exactly what do you mean, Miss McLeod? Oh, he's a hard man, you know. 
They're always arguing about the boy. Bruce this, Bruce that. He's a nice boy, I think. He's never done anything to me. Oh, but the arguments. Him and her all the time. Should the boy be paid for working? Shouldn't he? Why? Why not? When Ben and I finished with a list of Mrs. Kelby's friends, relatives, and employees, we started out on the neighbors. None of them saw Mrs. Kelby after 6 p.m. the night she disappeared. Two of the neighbors said they saw the porch light burning after 7 p.m., but both said the porch was empty. Mrs. Kelby was not sitting in her chair at the usual time after dinner. According to them, that was one of her habits. It was 10 minutes to 6 by the time Ben and I got back to the office. The light was still burning in Captain Kearney's office. Full day, Joe. Not a morning. Yeah. I wonder what the captain's hanging around for. Let's find out. Get anything? Pretty good luck, Cap. Yeah. Good. I've got some more for you. Just walked in five minutes ago. What do you mean, Frank? Who walked in? Bruce Kelby. He's waiting in the next room. We went in the next room and met Bruce Kelby. He was small for a 17-year-old, dark-haired and a little on the sickly side. He told us that he couldn't keep the date he made with us on the phone because his stepfather apparently did overhear the conversation and drove him directly to his sister's home in Alhambra. We asked him why he was so sure that his stepfather was responsible for his mother's sudden disappearance. For one thing, all three of us usually go to the early show on Sunday night. Eric, Mom, and me. But last Sunday, Eric said he wasn't feeling good and he wanted Mom to stay home and take care of him. Then he told me to go on ahead to the show, so I did. What time did you get home, son? About 9.30, quarter to ten. Mm. What was your stepfather doing when you got home? Sitting in the living room, reading the paper. You notice anything unusual about the way he acted? He was nervous and jumpy, more than usual, I think. Anything else? Yes, sir. When I came in through the front yard, I noticed the dogs had mud all over their paws. They'd been out somewhere in the nursery plots. And they won't go out in the plots unless Eric's with them. He doesn't want them to trample the seedlings. What would your stepfather be doing out in the nursery at night? Does he usually do some work at night? No, sir. None of the plots are even lighted. Only the greenhouses. And the paths in the greenhouses are usually graveled, aren't they? No mud around. It's my job to see that the greenhouse paths are kept graveled. I know they're not muddy. I, I fixed them the day before, Saturday. What do you think it means, son? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to think about it. I, I just know he's done something. He's done something to her. Did your stepfather give you any reason for keeping you away from the police officers the other day? No, sir. He said people were getting nosy, and he said it might be better for me over at Aunt Bertha's. She's his sister. Do you think your Aunt Bertha might know where your mother is? No, we hardly ever see her. We don't know her well at all. We've heard your mother and your stepfather argued about whether you should be paid for your work in the nursery. When I started to work for him, he promised he'd pay me. I was saving up to buy a 31 Model A. And then after a couple of months, when he didn't pay me, I asked him. He told me I ought to be glad to work for him for nothing. And your mother argued with him over that? Sure. It was her money that bought the nursery anyway. How'd you get away from your aunt's place last night? Well, Bertha had some shopping to do, and she left me alone. She locked the door to my room. Even the screen over the window in my room was nailed down, but I kicked it out and got away. I uh, stayed at a friend's house last night. You thought about where you're going to stay tonight? I don't know. But I'm not going home, and I'm not going back to Bertha's place either. I'll get a room. How'd you like to stay at my house a few days? Sure nice of you, sir. Maybe I'd better not. Mom might not like it. Oh, I'll take care of that. Now, let's hop out and get some dinner. Sure darn nice of you, sir. All right, son. Come with me. What do you think, Joe? He could be lying. Yeah. <laughs> Now what, Cap? Shall we bring Kelby in again? No, not yet. He's found out by now from his sister that the boy's gone. He probably figures the police station is the first place he'd come. Wouldn't do much good pulling him in now, Ben. We couldn't even question him. Ten to one, his lawyer would be waiting for us when we got back. That's the problem. How do we get to this Kelby without his lawyer finding out? Well, what about the early morning, Cap? Say tomorrow, about 5 or 6 a.m. Think he'd be looking for us then? Yeah, that might do it. We can just get by that pack of hounds he owns... Without waking the whole neighborhood, might work. If we could just question him alone, I've got an idea it wouldn't take much to make him cop out. All right, give it a try. Get out there in the early morning and bring him in for questioning as quietly as possible. I'll be in at 6 a.m. If you want me before then, call me at home. All right, Frank. 
Kelby's got a smart lawyer. It's going to be plenty hard to convict him without a body and corroborating evidence. He's got four acres out there, Cap. You can hide a lot of bodies in four acres. Well, that's what I mean. This case isn't ending. It's just beginning. The next morning, Ben and I met at the office about a few minutes past 4 a.m. We had a cup of coffee and a donut at an all-night restaurant, and then we started for the Kelby place out on Belasco Road. We took four pounds of fresh horse meat with us to keep the dogs quiet if they raised a fuss. It was 28 minutes past 4 when Ben pulled the car to a stop a few hundred feet from the gate to the Kelby nursery. We got out of the car and made our way down the road to the gate. I reached in and tried the latch. It was padlocked. The dog started in. Okay, Ben, looks like we'll have to jump the fence. Toss some of that horse meat over to him. Yeah, yeah, here. That's it. Come on, let's climb. Keep an eye on those hounds. Looks like they could chew your leg off. Yeah. Here comes a third one, Ben. Toss some more meat. Yeah. There you are, boy. Go get it. Go get it, boy. Look, Ben, light's going on in the house. Come on, let's make it fast. Who is it? Who's there? I'll set the dogs on you. Police officers, Mr. Kelby. What? What are you doing out here this time of night? You're under arrest, Kelby. Get your coat. You cops are asking for a peck of trouble. Get your coat. Where's my stepson? What have you done with him? What have you done with your wife? You're going to pay for this. I'll have your jobs. That's not the first time we heard that, Kelby. Let's go. Lights burning in the captain's office. Yeah. All right, Kelby, in here. I'm pay for this. Mark my word. Ben, take him in the office here and stay with him. I'll see if Frank's in yet. All right, Joe. Come on, Kelby, inside. Friday? You bring in Kelby? He's down in the interrogation room. Ben's with him. Somebody saw you. Don't think so. They must have. Kelby's lawyer's sitting in the next room. Kelby again refused to answer any questions without the advice of his attorney. We released him. That day, Captain Kearney sent out two men to keep an eye on the nursery and report on all of Kelby's movements. Shortly after 7 o'clock that night, just after nightfall, we tried once again to bring in Kelby for questioning without his lawyer's knowledge. It didn't work. A little after we booked him, his lawyer obtained a writ of habeas corpus. We had to release him again. The two men assigned to stake out the Kelby place reported definitely that somebody was tipping the lawyer whenever unknown visitors showed up at the nursery and drove off with Kelby. There was nothing we could do about it. Next morning, Kearney came up with a lead. I had a long talk with the boy last night. Accidentally, I think he's given us a pretty good lead. Yeah? There's only one way we'll ever get a conviction. That's by finding the body and evidence to tie Kelby in. Yeah, that'll do it. Where do we start looking? In a new rose bed next to one of the greenhouses in Kelby's nursery. Hmm? The kid came up with it last night. How come? First, Kelby's crazy about saving a dollar and making one. Yeah. In the nursery trade, especially where you have a limited area to work in, like Kelby, you cultivate every foot of ground. Every bit of soil you've got is planted with something. Mm-hmm. Kelby's not the type to waste anything. Especially he's not the kind that would let ground life fallow when he could plant something that might bring in a few dollars next season. Bruce tells me his stepfather has every inch of those four acres planted. Every inch. Except a six-by-nine-foot plot of ground in that rose garden. Well, that sounds like a long shot to me, Frank. The boy said he prepared that piece of ground for planting late Saturday afternoon. His stepfather wanted it ready for Sunday morning. The plot of ground's still vacant. Might have planted it yesterday, Cap. When's the last time you checked? Mm, before I came to work this morning. I called the men on stake out next to the nursery. They told me the plot's still empty. Mm-hmm. It's worth a chance, Frank. When do we look it over? Tonight. I don't want Kelby or his lawyer to know a thing until we find that body. Well, how are we going to work it? We'll order up a crew from the crime lab. They can take probings through that plot and all around it. They can tell us without any guesswork how deep that ground's been worked over lately. When do you want to start? Be here in the office at 8.30 tonight. If my hunches are any good, we'll find a body. It was ten minutes past nine that night when we got to the Kelby place. Lieutenant Lee Jones and his assistants, Kearney, Ben, and two other men from Homicide. The men on stakeout told us that Kelby had left about 20 minutes before in a dark blue coupe. Ben brought along the usual supply of horse meat for the dogs so we didn't have any trouble there. We found the empty plot of ground in the rose bed next to the greenhouse, exactly as Bruce described it to Kearney. Ground's been worked over all right, boys. 
At least four to five feet down. All right, Lee, let's start digging. Romero, take care of the dogs. Watson, grab one of these shovels. Right, Captain. Hey, you ever said these dogs were vicious, didn't you? Yeah, why? Look at these hounds. They're no more vicious than a lively cold, look. Higgins, get that light over here, will you? Thanks. What is it, Lee? Let me see. Teeth. Set of false teeth. Been in the ground long? Don't think so, judging from the shape they're in. How far down would you say you are, Lee? A couple of feet. Ground's real soft. Lee, come here a minute. What is it? Body. Here's the shoulder. All right, you men over here with Watson. Get the dirt off the face. Romero, you got a picture of the Calby woman? Yeah, Captain. Okay, but... Let's see. Oh, here it is. Thanks. Get the light down here. Hunch paid off, Frank. That's her. Ben and I went back to the car and notified communications to broadcast a want for murder on Eric Kelby. His description, together with the description of the car and license number of the car he was driving, was rebroadcast every 15 minutes. Then we went back to check the house. We found the front door unlocked. We went inside and looked around. In one bedroom, we found clothes scattered over the bed and the floor. There was only one old suit remaining in the closet. On the table next to the bed, we found an airline's timetable. We got to the phone and notified communications to alert all police details at railroad stations, bus terminals, and airlines, and then to send out an APB on the teletype. After that, we checked with the airlines. One of them told us that a man answering Kelby's description had booked passage for Mexico City. The plane was scheduled to take off at 10.40 that night from Burbank Airport. Ben's watch said four minutes past ten. We called the detail at the airport and alerted them. Then we drove over to check in person. It was 10.35 p.m. when Ben and I took up our positions just inside gate three, where passengers were boarding flight 72 for Mexico City. He's cutting it close, Joe. Got about four minutes more to get flying. We waited. The crowd got thicker as departure time came closer. At 10.39, Eric Kelby came through the main entrance, across the terminal, through gate three, into a pair of handcuffs. Gosh, I don't understand. What does this mean? We found your wife's body, Kelby. What? I don't know what you're talking about. In the rose patch next to the greenhouse. Your lawyer can't help this time. Mexico City. Would have been a nice trip. Expensive. I'll plead insanity. I didn't know what I was doing. Be a nice vacation next year, Joe, Mexico City. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I didn't mean it. She slapped me. We were arguing about the boy. I didn't mean it. I don't know if you did or not, Kelby, but you killed her. Come on. You missed your plane. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Eric Kelby was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He is now awaiting execution in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 14th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to William J. Weston, Jr. of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of March 4th, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, You'll want to listen to Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. The Pet Note Show, usually heard at this time, has moved to a new time period on Sunday nights. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Arman on the new Pet Note Show, tomorrow night on NBC. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Sergeant, you're assigned to homicide.
by detail. A 22-year-old girl has disappeared. A letter has been received. It demands $30,000 for the girl's return. The letter is signed, The Wolf. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 18th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief detective. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the staff's office, and it was 3.26 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Got those mugs you asked for, Jeff. Here they are. Thanks, Harris. Backstrand leaves yet? In a minute. I'm going out with him. What's the address out there, the Sullivan place? 814 Castro Boulevard. You go straight out Santa Monica, take a left at Castro. I remember. You ready, Chief? Yeah, man. Friday, you call Romero yet? Right now. Get on it. This one we don't fool with. Yeah. Come on, Harris. Hello. I'm sorry to wake you, Ben. This is Joe. How are you feeling? Oh, hi, Joe. What time is it? 3.30 a.m. How do you feel? Oh, a lot better. Be back to work tomorrow. You'll be ready in 20 minutes. I'll pick you up. 20 minutes? Okay, what's up? You remember Martin Sullivan, vice president of the Third National Bank? Sullivan? Yeah, yeah, what about him? He's got a 22-year-old daughter, or he had one. She's gone. Good time, Joe. Yeah. Where are we heading? Sullivan home out on Castro Boulevard. Ed's out there now with Harris. Mm. Any leads to work on? No, nothing so far. The girl disappeared a little before 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon. At 11 last night, he got a letter. They want $30,000. Sullivan hasn't got that kind of money. Yeah, I know it. Poor guy's almost out of his mind. Fill me in. How did it happen? Well, the guy took the girl out of business school. He had her called out of class. Told her her father was sick, said he was a friend of the family's. Well, how about the teachers? What was their story? Said the girl didn't want to go with the man at first, but he finally talked her into it. Kept telling her her father was dying. That's about as low as it come? Yeah. Did he use a car? Witnesses said it was a blue sedan. They didn't get the license number or the make. Did they remember what the guy looked like? About 5'9", 160, brown suit, dark hair. Hmm. Nothing else? No. Here's a copy of the letter. The usual. Read it. Yeah. Yeah. I have your daughter, Judy. Get, uh, what, what's that? $30,000. $30,000 quick if you want her back alive. Don't call police or I'll kill her. Contact you later. Signed, uh, uh what was it? The Wolf. Oh, Wolf. Huh? I could think of a better name. Come on, here we are. He's got the original note, Joe. Lee Jones down at the crime lab. He's checking it for prints and handwriting. Well, if he was... Oh, hi, Dave. Uh, right on in the house, boys. Just waiting for you. Thanks, Dave. Hi, Joe. Ben. In the living room. Mm, thank you. That's the way I see it, Mr. Sullivan. Now, you understand exactly what you have to do? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll do as you say. All right. Here are the two men who will help you. Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Homicide. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how do you do? How do you Mr. Backstrand, I, uh, I, are you sure about all this? He, he, he might get frightened. He, he might do something to Judy. I... Believe me, Mr. Sullivan, it's the only way. I know how you must feel, but we can't do anything else. Oh, all right, I, I want to see Mrs. Sullivan first. I, I'll be ready in a moment. Any developments? Yeah. Come on back in the dining room. There it is on the table. Second note from the guy. Mm, telegram. When did this come? About half an hour ago. Guy phoned it into Western Union from a public booth. Couldn't trace it. I see. Yeah. Be at Elysian Park, 
five o'clock this morning near Balkan Drive. Come alone. Bring 30,000. We'll return girl. Don't tell cops. Kill her if you do. The wolf. 4 a.m. now, Skipper. Not much time. I know it. We'll have to do as he says. No other way. Then Sullivan's going out there alone? You're going with him. You and Romero. You'll be hidden out in the trunk of the car. Any plan? Get him. That's all. Ben and I went out the back door and into the Sullivan garage. We jammed ourselves into the trunk compartment and Harris closed the door on us. The latch was fixed so that the door could be pushed open from the inside. A few minutes later, Mr. Sullivan came out, got in the car, and we drove off. At three minutes to five, we pulled up at the meeting place in Elysian Park. We waited. Nothing happened. At five minutes past five, it started to thunder. That's all we need now. Thunderstorm. Don't come back here again. If he's watching, you might tip him off. Oh, oh all right. All right. Poor guy. Yeah. I hear it. He's coming up the road toward us. It's stopping. Yeah. He's coming over to our car. You ready? Right. Talking with Sullivan. Yeah. They're coming back here. Now watch it. Sandy, Romero. That you, Ed? Yeah, the meeting's off. Come on out. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Got a cramp in my leg. Well, I'm cramped all over. Mr. Sullivan, drive back home. We'll contact you there. All right. All, all right, Chief. Ben, Joe, come on over to the car. Well, what's the story, Ed? The guy had no intention of following through with this meeting tonight. Well, how come? He told us. Phone at five o'clock. Tried to trace the call. He wouldn't stay on the line long enough. What did he have to say? He wanted more money. Bragged about how smart he was. How we'd never get him. Well, he knows Sullivan's called in the police. Sure. Said he didn't care. We'd never get him anyway. Yeah, pretty cocky. Pretty smart. Take my word for it. He's no dummy. Control one to 80K. Control one. I'll get it. 80K to control one. 80K to control one. Go ahead. 80K, go to your office. All right, Romero, let's roll. More than 12 hours had passed since word of Judy Sullivan's disappearance had been phoned in a homicide. During that time, an all-points bulletin containing the descriptions of the suspect, his car, and the girl had been sent out on the teletype to law enforcement agencies throughout the area. The same descriptions were broadcast over the police radio every hour. The Sullivan home had been placed under strict surveillance, and Mr. Sullivan instructed not to contact the suspect without knowledge of the police. He'd raised almost $10,000 in cash to buy him off. The serial number on each one of the bills had been copied by a police stenographer and then rechecked by a homicide officer. So far, the wolf, as he called himself, had made three separate contacts, but he'd covered his tracks well. We knew that he was somewhere in the city, 500 square miles of it, and we knew we had to find him fast. It was 18 minutes past six when we got back to homicide. Hi, Chief. Fellas. You got something for us, Mac? Here, this letter. Special delivery. Came in about 25 minutes. Can I see that, Mike? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, according to the postmark, he must have mailed it right after he grabbed the girl. Yeah, listen to this. Stay away from Sullivan. If the kid's found dead, it's your fault. Stay away, the wolf. All right, Mike. Get it over to the crime lab and have Lee check it for prints. Right, Chief. 
Will you find any press on the second note, Mike? Two. Running through R and I now. Friday, Romero. Get down there and see if they got a make. I'll call out the Sullivans and check with Harris. Right, Ed. Let's go there. Who's watching the Sullivan house beside Harry? Uh, Carpenter and Davis. Max Grant's afraid the girl father will try to make a deal with the guy. Has he tried it yet? No, he hasn't yet. You couldn't blame him if he did. Word's sick. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Hi, fellas. Just coming down to see you. You got something, Larry? Those two prints Lee Jones lifted off that letter. Got a make on them from the single print file. That's good, Larry. Let's see, huh? There it is. Pull the whole package on them. Donald Alfred Kiefer. Looks like a real bad one, doesn't he? <laughs> Donald Alfred Kiefer, male, Caucasian, age 29, 5 feet 8 inches, 170 pounds, brown eyes, dark brown hair. He had one previous arrest for forgery in Los Angeles 10 months before. Kiefer's occupation at the time of his arrest was listed as bank clerk at the Third National Bank. Ben went back into the files and pulled the crime report. Then we called Ed Backstrand. There's the answer, Skipper. At the time Kiefer pulled that forgery job at the bank, Mr. Sullivan was one of the vice presidents. Mm, go on. Sullivan was the one who preferred charges against Kiefer and saw that he was prosecuted. Where's this Kiefer now? Well, let me see. He was placed on probation, and on May 16th this year, he returned to his home in Omaha, Nebraska. That's 1380 Mackinac Avenue. All right, Ramel. Get Omaha on the phone and have them check out Kiefer. Right, Skipper. Friday, take Kiefer's package and this note down to Don Myers. Have him check the handwriting. And get over to the crime lab and see what Jones lifted off that last letter we got. All right, Ed. The faster we work, the faster we'll put this guy behind bars. Now move. How's the writing compared, Don? What'd you find? Yeah, it looks good. See here? Slants as crosses, double loops as L's, open A's, pressure on the downstroke. Donald Kiefer, the wolf, same handwriting. Lifted three prints off this last note, Joe. Brought them out to the iodine fume gun. They match with the first. Thanks, Lee. Did you find anything else? I don't know if it'll help you much. We examined the paper for watermarks and texture. Both notes are written on the same kind of paper. Impressions show both pieces of paper from the same tablet. Check the density of the carbon and the pencil he used. Both specimens match. Same pencil. By mid-afternoon, Donald Keeper's description had been broadcast throughout the area. Bulletins were dispatched to all departments, and an APB was teletyped to the entire state. Men were stationed at every post office in the city to watch for notes that might come through the mail. The bus depots, railroad terminals, the airports, and all the main roads leading out of the city were under strict surveillance. The entire Los Angeles area was broken down into single square mile districts, and a house-to-house -house canvas was started. A squad of men were assigned to cover each square mile. Outlying towns and cities were requested to do the same. By 5 o'clock that afternoon, the greatest dragnet operation in the history of the city was underway. We were sure Donald Kiefer was somewhere inside. At 12 minutes past 5, Ben got the call back from the Omaha police. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. 6X-Ray 419. Nebraska Place, right. Well, thank you a lot. Yeah, bye. They had a make on the car. Lots more. The Omaha cops are looking for Kiefer, too. Want him for a robbery there two months ago. Yeah? And that robbery used a stolen 1939 blue sedan. Nebraska license plate, 6X-Ray 419. Well, how about his family and his friends back there? They all been checked? Yeah, they said Kiefer left Omaha about six weeks ago. Didn't know where he was heading. Well, get that car description to communications, huh? APB, teletype, and broadcast. I'll tell him. Yeah, right, Joe. Right in, Romero. Yeah, Ed. What are you tied up with? We well, just got a call from Omaha. Make on Keeper in the car. Give it to me. You two get out to the Sullivan house as fast as you can. See Harris. What's happened, Skipper? Martin Sullivan's disappeared. All right, Harris. How'd it happen? About three this afternoon, Mr. Sullivan got a phone call. Said he had to go down to the bank. I went with him. He had me wait in the reception room, and he went in his office. After waiting ten minutes, I got suspicious and went in. He was gone. That's it. Did he get any more money? This morning. Five thousand dollars. Did you get the serial numbers off the bills? Yeah. Shouldn't have let him get out of my sight. Forget it. Right now, we've got to find out where he's gone to meet Kiefer. Did you talk to Mrs. Sullivan about it, Harris? She says she doesn't know anything about it. Let's try her again. Come on, let's go inside. Hi, fellas. Hi. Where's Mrs. Sullivan, Dave? Back in the sitting room, lying down. Doctor's with her. Come on. What time is that, Ben? Mm, 6.35. I'll get it. Hello? Well, where are you? Oh. Where are you now? Where are you now? We'll be right out. That was Martin Sullivan. He met with Kiefer. Up in Laurel Canyon. 
Did he get his daughter back? Yeah. Wrapped in newspapers. All cars in the area were notified that a contact had been made with Kiefer. We got in the car and drove out to Laurel Canyon. The entire area had been blocked off. We found Martin Sullivan standing in the middle of the road at the end of East Winding Way. 500 feet down the hill was a private residence where Sullivan had telephoned us. It was the only building in the immediate vicinity. A few yards beyond the point where East Winding Way ended, back in a clump of tall grass, we found the body of Martin Sullivan's daughter. We notified the crime lab, Chief Backstrand in the corner. Despite a severe state of emotional shock, Martin Sullivan tried to tell us the story. He said, Judy, it's all right. I believed him. I wanted her back. Judy. I tricked the officer, the one watching me, said, come along, no police. Did you see his car, Mr. Sullivan? I wanted her back. I wanted Judy back. I... I did as he said. I drove here at six o'clock and I waited. I put the money on the front seat, like he, like he said. Did he get the money, Mr. Sullivan? And I... I got out. I left parking lights on. I stood up there by the end of the road, waiting. Mr. Sullivan. And he drove up. He, he took the money. Then he came up to me. He had a gun. I wanted to shoot him back. He had a gun. Did you see his car? He said she was up there behind the road. Tied to a tree. Back. Mr. Sullivan, did you see his car? I went to look for Judy. He drove away. She wasn't there. By the tree. Couldn't find her. I knew we back. I, I saw the bundle on the way back. Before he went into a state of complete collapse, we showed Martin Sullivan a picture of Donald Alfred Kiefer. He definitely identified him. The information was immediately relayed back to Central Division, rebroadcast to the entire police radio system. A teletype was dispatched to sheriff's offices, and communications were sent to police stations throughout the country. The house-to-house -house search throughout the entire city intensified. The dragnet in which we hoped to trap Donald Kiefer was drawing slowly inward. It was 12 midnight. Next street, Sullivan, Gerald, Martyr, next street. Read all about it. Citizens join search for killers. Friday, did the papers get a list of the numbers on that ransom money? Yeah, it got them in the final net edition. Two and a half pages of serial numbers gave it a big spread. Look at these pictures of Kiefer here, all over the front page. The more the better, Romero. I hope this town never forgets that face. Good reminder. You don't make deals with killers. Hi, fellas. Come on over. Find anything yet, Lee? Just checking over these towels here. Found them wrapped around the girl's body, inside the papers. Funny thing about those papers. What's that, Lee? They're all yesterdays. Every story about the girl's disappearance has been clipped out. Maybe the guy's making up a scrapbook. How about the towels, Jones? Any laundry marks? Not a one so far, Ed. Every one of them was clipped off. Pretty smart. The morgue post the body in? They're doing it now. Yeah, nasty one. Yeah. Did you get any footprints or tire marks out where they found the body? Lots of them. All cast. Bossy and Taylor are checking them. No one thing. What is it, Jones? I don't know. Under the scene here, this towel. Wait a minute. Joe, hmm? that pair of snippers there. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. Press back under the seat. There. That's one tag he missed. Any markings, Lee? Yeah. Greenway Apartments, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. One look at the apartment was enough. 
In an adjoining garage, we found the car which Kiefer had used, a blue sedan. Nebraska license plate 6X-ray 419. When we got back to the office, Chief Baxter and immediately issued a cancellation of the want order for the blue sedan. And then he ordered a detail of men to stake out the car in the event Kiefer decided to come back for it. Here's the coroner's report, Joe. Oh, let's see it. Uh, cause of death, strangulation. Time of death, Monday, October 18th, approximately 2 p.m. One hour after he grabbed her? Uh, I can't be right. Skipper in his office? No, he's out for a minute. Hey, Joe, Ben, take the call up 2503, will you? Thanks, Mike. Glad. Would you give me the call on 2503, please? Thanks. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, when? We'll be right over. Some of the ransom money, Ben, just showed up. Beverly and Highland. Come on. The man's name was Ralph Donahue. He operated a used car lot on the corner of Beverly and Highland. He told us that early that morning he sold a dark blue late model coupe to a man who gave his name as Fred Sims. The man paid for the car in cash. Donahue told us that he checked the serial numbers on the bills after the man had driven away. Serial numbers check out, Joe, every one of them. If I only thought to look, officer, and you know I generally do, I'm the suspicious kind anyway, but, well, this morning I must have been asleep. We got the full description on the car, Ben? Yeah, Joe. All right, let's get it on the air right away. I saw his mug in the paper while I was waiting for you. Too late. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Ten minutes past three that afternoon, another piece of the ransom money turned up at a busy downtown department store. The clerk was unable to remember who gave her the bill. The detail throughout the general downtown area was strengthened. The house-to-house search of the entire city for Judy Sullivan's murderer went on. The afternoon dragged into the early evening. At 20 minutes to seven, Ben and I had a hamburger and a cup of coffee in the drugstore at East Broadway and 3rd. And then we got back in the car, checked with communications, and started cruising the neighborhood again. Nine minutes to eight, a man answering the description of Donald Keeper was seen crossing Sunset Boulevard just below Highland. Seven minutes later, the same man was reported near the intersection of Hollywood Boulevard and Las Palmas. Communications relayed the information. At 21 minutes past eight, our car, 80K, along with a dozen others, were concentrated in the Hollywood Boulevard area from Gower Street to La Brea, Franklin Avenue to Santa Monica Boulevard. At 24 minutes past 8, another piece of the ransom money was passed at a cigar store on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Hawthorne Street. The number of men and radio cars in the area was redoubled. Plainclothes officers were stationed at every intersection to keep an eye on pedestrian traffic. At 18 minutes to 9, the dark blue coupe which Kiefer had bought that morning was spotted parked in an alley just below Hollywood Boulevard and Coenga. We called Ed Backstrand. City Hall. 2503. 2503. Chief of Detectives Office, Hannah. This is Friday, Mike. The chief there? Yeah, wait a minute. Just going out the door. Ed, is for you. Backstrand. Friday, Ed. Just spotted Keeper's car, the one he bought this morning, parked in an alley off Coenga. Harris and I are on our way out there now. We'll take care of the car. You take care of this call. Just came in. What do you got? The theater on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. A girl in the box office just took in a $10 ransom bill. Yeah? She got a good look at the man who passed the bill. She says it's Keeper. <laughs> Ben, come on. Yeah. You've got the list of serial number? Right here. Let's check at the window. Yes, sir. How many, please? Police officers. Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Rayburn, the police are here. Would you step around to the side door, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Margie, relieve Francis for a minute. Francis, come here. Bring that $10 bill with you. Sharp girl, officer, that Francis. Sharp. Here it is, Mr. Rayburn. Uh, all right, Sergeant. There you are. $10 bill and the list of serial numbers. Check out all right, Ben. That's it, Joe. Good work, man. You reported the man came in about a half hour ago. You're sure it was Kiefer? Yes, sir. I had his picture in the box office just behind the change machine. I recognized him right away. And as far as you know, he hasn't left the theater. That's right, sir. All right, Mr. Rayburn. I'm sorry. I'm afraid we'll have to interrupt the show. Anything you say, Sergeant. Anything. Ben, you keep an eye on the front exit. I'll call communications. All right, Joe. 80K to Control 4. 80K to Control 4. 80K, go ahead. Control 4, clear all frequencies. The Sullivan murder suspect, Donald Kiefer, has been located in the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. Have all units surround the area. 80K, Roger. Attention all units. Attention all units. Assist 80K at the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. The Sullivan murder suspect has been located in the theater. Go ahead, 80K. 
Control 4. Have all units converge in the general area, Hollywood Boulevard and Fairview. Unit 62R to block off the intersection at Hollywood Boulevard and North Cherokee. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 61A to block the intersection at Hollywood Boulevard and Hudson Street. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 71 and 72R to block the alley behind the theater. Unit 66 and 67R to assist at main entrance to the theater. Within a few minutes, the one-half-mile area around the theater was completely blockaded. Every exit and entrance to the theater was covered. At 9.23, we met Harris and Ed Backstrand in the theater manager's office. Backstrand outlined our plan of operation. At 9.28, a detail of 14 men walked down the side aisles on the main floor of the theater and took up their posts on either side of the orchestra pit. The picture was stopped and every light in the theater was turned on. Ed Backstrand, Harris, Ben, and I went down the aisle and up onto the stage. Backstrand made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry to interrupt the picture, but this is important. We're police officers. We've traced the murderer of Judy Sullivan to this theater. He is in this theater now. And we're going to search the theater row by row, and we'd like to ask your cooperation. There's no need to be panicky or afraid. Those who wish to leave now may do so. Leave by the main entrance. Each one of you will be checked as you go out the door. And for the benefit of the man we're looking for, don't try to escape. Every exit is covered and the entire area is blockaded. Don't place any more lives in jeopardy. Come on, Ben. Backstage, Joe. We can make it from there. All right, let's go. Come on, hustle it, Ben. Yeah. The next building. You'll probably try to jump for it. All right, watch it. I think this door leads out to the roof. There he goes. All right, keep her. Hold it. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I give up. Throw your gun down. Over here. Don't shoot. Don't. Let's get him. All right, coppers. I got it figured. They won't top me for this. Didn't know what I was doing. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Get away from me, you crumb. Ooh. You shouldn't have hit him, keeper. Try the cuffs now. Yeah. Come on, let's get him in out of the rain. What's the hurry? Why spoil a good rain? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Donald Alfred Kiefer was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 15th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Deputy United States Marshal John B. Glenn of Boise, Idaho, who on the morning of July 31st, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC. Another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Homicide Bureau. A police officer has been shot, mortally wounded. One of the suspects has been apprehended. The other is still at large. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, 
You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 16th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, two detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.58 a.m. when we got to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, second floor, room five. Treatment room. All right, he made good time. How's Ben, Mr. Doc? Got in the lungs, Ben, three times. He's going fast. His wife with him? Yeah, they're bringing him down now. Can we talk to him? Yeah, make it fast. Come on, Joe. Yeah. This way. Easy. John. John, it's Friday in Romero. I want to talk to you a minute. Uh, Doc. Doc, it burns. My chest. Burning up. Nurse? Yes, doctor? Are the hypodermic? Uh, yes, doctor. Yeah, easy. All right, fellas. Don't take too long. John, it's Joe Friday. Can you tell us how it happened? Joe. Joe. How'd it happen, boy? Can you tell me? Can't figure it, Joe. Why'd he do it? We gotta find out. Now, how'd it happen? I don't know. I was directing traffic. East Broadway and First Street. Gray Coop. Pulled up for the stop. Gray Coop. How many men in the car? How many, John? Two. <coughs> Gray Coop. Pulled up for the stop. In the pedestrian... Pedestrian lane. Went over. Gonna ask him to back up. Back up out of lane. Just gonna ask him. Yeah, John, and then what? Driver. Dark hair. Eyes. Dark. Went over. Gonna, gonna ask him. Back up. Pointed a gun. No reason. Pointed a gun at me. All right, easy, John. Take it easy. No reason, Joe. No reason he fired. Hurry it up, Joe. Yeah. No. What about the other man in the car? Did you see him? Can you describe him? Joe. Joe, did you get him? Great coop. Driver. Guy with him. We've got the driver, John. He's upstairs. The other one got away. we got to find him. you got to help us. My wife. Somebody send for Dora. She's on her way. She'll be here in a minute. Now, can you tell us, the other man in the car, what did he look like? Great Coop. What did he look like? Don't press him, Joe. <laughs> Great Coop. The driver. Pointed a gun. Dark hair. Yeah, yeah I know the other man, John. We got the driver. What did the other man look like? Send for Dora. Come on, Ben. Thanks, Doc. Okay, Joe. Going fast. Yeah. John got any kids? Two. Always pick a family man. This thing's got a phony ring to it, Ben. You don't just pull a gun and shoot a man. Not if you're sane, you don't. Here's the stairs. The guy we got is as sane as they come. And how do we explain it? All I know is that hood shot John Bemis, and I want to know why. Mm. Might be a lead in that car he was driving. Maybe. Come on, here we are. Phone message for you, Friday. Came in a few moments ago. Thanks, Davis. From R and I. They got a make? Take a look. No make or warrants on James Vickers, Greg. Let's talk to him. Come on. Yeah. Minor wound, Joe. Bullet penetrated the fleshy part of his hand. Didn't touch the bone. Thought this guy had an arm wound, too. Just a neck, man. That officer you shot, Vickers. He's dying. Is he? He's a family guy. Got a wife, two kids. Has he? Why did you shoot him, Vickers? Ask him. We did. Then you know the reason. Said there wasn't any reason. That's right. Look, we're going to make you on this, Vickers. You know that, don't you? I don't know anything. Why'd you shoot him? Shut up. Why'd you shoot him? Joe. Yeah. Davis? Yeah? Stay with him. Bye. Doc, get us an MT slip on this guy, will you? We'll be back in a minute. Come on, man. All right, Joe. I'll have it ready. Easy, Joe. Oh, easy, nothing. I've seen too many good cops like Bemis cut down by punks like that Vickers. Getting mad won't help. Come on, down the stairs. Yeah. Back to see Bemis? Why? Just for the record. I want to see if the doc thinks it's okay for us to bring Vickers down. I'd like to have Bemis definitely identify him as the guy who shot him. We've got three good witnesses. An identification for Bemis will clinch it. I want to see Vickers get everything he's earned when he goes to court. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> He went fast, Joe. Yeah. Is that his wife? Yeah. She make it in time? 
No? Did he say anything that it help? No, it might. He said a prayer. <laughs> Two six two five. Two six two five. Auto records, Crowley. Joe Friday, Vince. What about a make on that car used in the Beamer shooting this morning? Yeah, Joe, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Where are you now? Georgia Street, second floor. What about the make? Car was reported stolen yesterday afternoon. Registered to Harold Simpers, seven one six Everett Street. Report said the car was taken from a parking lot at Grand and Wabash. Okay, Vince. Thanks. What about the guns they found in the car? Lee Jones still has them over at the crime lab. He's running them through. No words yet. No. You make out the impound report on the car, Joe? Yeah, recovery report, too. They're still dusting for prints. MT slip ready, Doc? Yeah, right here, Ben. Medical card, history, MT slip. You ready, Vickers? Yeah. All right, put out your wrist. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Watch his hands. You saving me for the hot lights? All right, let's go. I'm not going to jail. You're in jail now. Looks like a hospital. Bars on the windows, aren't they? All right, come on. Give me a smoke. Here. Okay. Light. What do I get if I open up? No deal. My talk, make it attractive. Who was the other guy in the car? Hitchhiker. I always give rides. Then why'd he run when we chased you? Maybe he was scared. You're part of a gang. Maybe. Who was the other guy? What's it worth? Oh, come on, Vickers. You're wasting our time. Where are we going? All right. My hand hurts. I want to call my own doctor. You hear me? Yeah. That cop pulled his gun first. I can prove it. Yeah, down the stairs. Easy, huh? Where are we going? I said, where are we going? All right, what's it worth if I talk? I could tell you all about it. Let's make a deal. You'll tell us anyhow. Think so? All right, you, out the door. Uh, wait a minute, huh? Cigarettes out. All right, Ben, light it. Yeah. Nice of you guys. Thanks. <laughs> oh, oh, get up, Ben. Wait up, stop. He's crossing the street. Fire over his head. Watch the crowd. Vickers! Joe, he's running for that car. All right, let's hold it, Vickers. All right, stop it, Vickers. Please stop. Come on, Joe. All right, come on. Get back, please. Let us through here. Let us through. Shall I call a doctor, Joe? No, he wouldn't be interested. The guy's dead. James Vickers, murder suspect, address unknown, died almost instantly at 1.13 p.m., November 16th, while attempting to escape. His body was taken to the county morgue where it was posted. All the personal effects found on the body were listed by the coroner and a receipt for them given to our office. At 8.35 the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief of Detectives Ed Backstrand. Those four guns they found in the car Vickers was driving, they're all U.S. Army property. Where were they stolen from, Skipper? I don't know. Each one of the guns is stamped U.S. Army, that's all. Well, that makes it easy. The coroner find anything on the body? Nothing to tell us why Vickers decided to kill a traffic cop. What did Bemis say before he died? He was on traffic duty yesterday morning down at East Broadway and First. At 10.35, a gray coupe pulled up for a stop sign. Vickers was driving. Uh -huh. Bemis started over to tell him to back up out of the pedestrian zone. Vickers pulled a gun and shot him. How'd they catch Vickers? Chased him three miles before he piled into a lumber truck. The guy with him got away. Fine. Checked R and I. No make or warrants on Vickers. Kicked back right in on his fingerprint. All right. What's your guess, Freddy? I don't have one, Ed. Vickers could have been hopped up. Doc Stanley over at Georgia Street said no. He checked him. Uh, wait a minute. Back, Strand. Yeah, hold on. For you, Friday. Okay, thanks. Friday talking. Yeah. Yeah, good. Be right over, Lee. We're in business, Ed. Crime Lab just found Vickers' address. <laughs> It is, Joe. Thanks, Lee. Let's see, huh? Silver Dollar Hotel. 
received a Mr. James Vickers, $6.50, room 345. Where'd you find it, Ming? None of the front seat, in with the tools. Anything else? Not a thing. How about prints? Two. Kind of smudged. Hope we can run a make with them. No prints on those four guns, Lee? Smeared. Not enough to classify. Well, this is it, Ben. That's all we got. Come on, let's see if we can make it pay off. We located the Silver Dollar Hotel on East Grand between 16th Street and Pico. It was an old-type frame building with a brightly colored neon sign jutting out over the sidewalk just above the dark entrance. The manager's name was Luther Gage. We showed him a picture of James Vickers. He definitely identified him as one of his former tenants. He told us that Vickers had stayed at the hotel one week in room 345 and that he had checked out two days ago. Was Vickers staying here alone, Mr. Gay? Yes, alone, quiet man. Did he have any visitors? Maybe. Wouldn't know. Paid his bills, spent most of his time away from the hotel. Good tenant. Did Vickers have any friends here in the hotel? Mm, maybe. Fell in the room next to Mr. Vickers. He still lives here. Two of them used to be kind of thick. Can we look at that room Vickers stayed in, Mr. Gage? Mm, let's see. Yes, it's still vacant. All right, this way. This man Vickers was friendly with, what's his name, Gay? Mm, Knight. Raymond Knight. Room 343. Is in his room now? No. Went out about 8 this morning. Here's the elevator. How well would you say Knight and Vickers knew each other? Couldn't say. Good tenants, both of them. Pay their bills. Did they go out together? Seem to know each other well? Wouldn't know. I don't pry. Look, this case involves murder, Mr. Gage. We told you that. We'd appreciate your cooperation. Cooperation don't pay the rent, Sergeant. Third floor. This way. Here. Three, four, five. Open it up. Nothing. Looks pretty clean, Joe. All my rooms are clean. You didn't mean it that way, Mr. Gage. I wonder if you'd show us Knight's room now. That's next door, isn't it? Hmm, I don't know about this. Poking into other people's rooms, not regular. Neither's murder. Come on, let's go. Does Mr. Knight have this room to himself? Sure ask questions, don't you? No, Knight has a friend staying with him. About two weeks now. Not in much. Is he in now? Don't think so. Oh, I... Ben, watch it! Oh, drop that, you! Oh, 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 oh. Bad shot, Mr. Gates, look out! Oh, oh. 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 out cold. Look what you've done to the room. I thought you said Knight wasn't in. He isn't. This is his friend. Great friends. 45 automatic in his hand. 38 snub nose in the bureau. Another 45. Look in his bag. I don't pry. He pays his bills. Good tenant. Yeah. Can I get outside on this phone? Mm, yes. All outside calls are 10 cents. Yeah. Here. Have to keep the books straight. Sure you do. Who's going to pay for the damage? Ask Mr. Knight's friend here. Well, say... Why worry? He pays his bills. Good tenant. I called Ed Backstrand, and he sent out a special detail to stake out the hotel and bring in Raymond Knight if and when he returned. Ben and I drove to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where Doc Stanley patched up the cut on Ben's scalp and treated Raymond Knight's friend for simple cuts and bruises. From papers found in his wallet and in the hotel room, he was identified as Frank Gannon, 9896 Wasatch Street, Kansas City, Missouri. When we got to headquarters, we had Gannon taken to the interrogation room where we questioned him briefly. He told us that he was a self-employed watch salesman, and that he was in the city on a business trip. He admitted friendship with Knight, but not with Vickers. We booked him at the county jail for assault with intent to commit murder. The three guns found in the hotel room were turned over to the crime lab. We report it back to the office. Show my head's pounding like mad. That Gannon's a mean. Yeah, it's a nasty crack. I got some aspirin in my desk. Might help. You're off. Hi, boys. Rough day. I don't get much rough already. Message for you on the desk. Oh, I'm gonna eat. Starving. Right, Tracy. 
What is it, Joe? Mm, Jones got a make on those prints he lifted off the car. Let's see. Yeah, something else to know on James Baker. Uh-huh. Wanted 101443, desertion, U.S. Army. That could account for those stolen army guns. Yeah. What about the make on those prints Lee found? Let's take a look. Vance Taylor's good solid record. Four burglaries, two armed robberies, two assaults. Wait a minute, here's the mama sheet. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Born so-and-so, age 36, height one. Alias John Fields, Harold Grant, Tom Bissell, Joe... Hey. Yeah, alias Raymond Knight. The other man who rode in the car with James Vickers the morning he shot down traffic officer Bemis finally had been identified. Vance Taylor, alias Raymond Knight. Well, that still didn't explain the unprovoked murder. It didn't explain the four guns found in the car or the three guns found in the hotel room. An assortment of arms like that could mean something big, but we didn't know what. Gannon's sudden willingness to shoot it out in the hotel room meant something, too. We didn't know what. We had Gannon brought back to the interrogation room. Hi, Gannon. Have a seat. Everything all right? I'll bet you're worried. No, we're not worried, Gannon. You ought to be. Don't make me laugh. You're tied in with Raymond Knight. That's enough for us. You send me up for it. We're going to try. Big talk. How long did you know Vickers? I didn't. Oh, funny. His prints are all over one of those guns we found in your room. I'm not worrying. Well, then you better start, Gannon. Vickers and Knight killed man. If you run with him, your hands are dirty, too. I room with Knight, that's all. Knight didn't come back to the hotel. Where is he? We're not that close. You share your guns and your friends. That's close enough for us. I don't know Vickers. You mean you didn't know him? I said I don't know him. We got Vickers, Gannon. He's dead. Good story. Okay. Come on, Gannon. Let's get out of the morgue. Down this way, Joe. It's cold today, isn't it? Yeah, it's damp. Bad sinus weather. Mm-hmm. Now, what is all this? Never seen a corpse before? No, I- I'm not in this. Take me back. I don't want to look. You can close your eyes. Take me back. I don't want to look. Here we are, fellas. Slam 45. This way, Gannon. I, I get sick. I don't want to look. Throw back the sheet, Fred. <sighs> Take a good no. look, Gannon. No, he's Knight's friend. I'm not in it. Who is in it? I don't know. I... Take me out. I'm sick. All right, Fred. Thanks. Okay, bud. Interrogation room, Friday. Joe, on stakeout at the Silver Dollar Hotel. No sign of Raymond Knight. Keep you posted. Okay, Dave. Thanks. How long does this go on? I can call a lawyer, you know. Then you better call one right away, Gannon. They just picked up Knight at the hotel. He's incriminated you. You're a liar. Sure. Like we were about Vickers. We'll prove it to you, Gannon. The officers are on their way in now. They're going to put Knight in the next room. You can listen to him. Look, I came here to sell watches. I ain't in this. Gannon, you and Vickers and Knight were planning a job, a big one. We know that. If you want to wait to get on the witness stand to tell your story, it's all right with us. Well, didn't take too long to break this one. Smoke, Joe? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah? Smoke? Hmm. What are you going to do? Nothing. Just kill a little time. They bring in night. You haven't got night. I haven't unwrapped him yet, Joe. Want to check me out? Okay, open him up. Mm-hmm. Give him a good shuffle, huh? You're going to have some time on your hands, Gannon. Want to learn a new card game? No. Suit yourself. It's a good game for two. Better with three. So a lot of cards. Yeah. You got two decks there. Well, first off, this game is quite a bit like gin rummy. Yeah? There are eight of every suit. Four jokers. Jokers count 50 points. Mm-hmm. Red threes count 100 points each. If you get a black three, you can freeze the deck. I see. I shouldn't say deck. In this game, they call it the pack. A pack? What's a pack? Well, it's the discard pile, same as in gin. You get a red three, you can freeze it. No, it's a black three. Well, what happens when you freeze it? Nobody can pick it up. Oh, I see. All right. Let's deal out a dummy hand here. Fine game, Gannon. Sure you won't change your mind? You don't want to play, Joe. All right, now I'm two-handed. You deal out 15 cards, see? 
How many can play? As many as six, I think. I've only played up to four. You play partners with four? Yeah, that's right. Okay, count your cards. That gets 15. Mm-hmm. 15, 14, 15, right. Now, now what do I do? Well, I guess you better lay your hand open. That'll be the easiest way to show you. Okay. Yeah, spread them all out over there. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have a great hand there. You got a couple of black threes. You can use those. Yeah, that's fine. They count 100 apiece. No, no, no. Those are red threes. Black threes don't count anything. Oh, red threes. That's right. Do you remember what black threes are for? Yeah, you can use them to freeze the pile. Pack. That's right. The pack. Well, you know what I mean. All right, now, look. You see, I got a joker here. Jokers are wild. Do you remember how much they count? They're wild. 100 points. No, red threes are worth 100. Jokers count 50. You don't explain it very good. I don't understand. Well, how simple can it be? Gannon's not even playing. You get it, don't you, Gannon? Okay, red threes count 100. Jokers count 50. Black threes, you can fi- you can freeze the, pi- uh, the pack. Yeah, good. Now, hold on to that, will you? Now, black threes freeze the pack, but that's not the only card that can do it. No? No. Deuces can do the same thing. Well, you see, the only difference is if you use a deuce, which is also wild, you have to have a natural pair in order to pick up the pack. Now, with a black three, it's I knew it. good until... I knew it wouldn't work. It was sour right from the start. Baker's killed a cop. Ben, I'm not in it. I'm right, coming on. I'm taking no raps. Johnny, the stenographer. Right, Ben. All right, Gannon. Too late. You haven't got time. 20 after 1, they're going to do it. Do what? Payroll. Brazier Company. Messenger leaves at 120. He's got the payroll. 30 grand. They're going to get him. Where does the messenger leave? 120. You're too late. I'm not in it. Where does he leave? 120 leaves the bank, I think. No, maybe the company. Where's the company? Third and Spring. They're going to get him. Where's the bank the messenger goes to? Up the block, Second National, Third and Hill. Where are they going to get the messenger? By the alley, Clay Street. I'm not in it. Ben, check it. Get out of communications. Have him put out a call to block up the area. Give him the details. All right. Johnny. Yeah, Joe. Stay with this guy. Okay. Davis. Davis. Brazier. 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 Manufacturing. Olympia. Manufacturing Company. Give me your payroll division. This is a police department emergency. Oh, what's that, sir? Your payroll division. It's an emergency. One moment, sir. Come on, hurry up. Payroll, Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins, this is Sergeant Friday, police department. We've had a tip your payroll messenger is going to be held up today. Has he left your building yet? The messenger? Yeah. Oh, my. He left early today. Went out the door about ten minutes ago. Thanks. Second National. Second National. Security. Second National. What's your old Friday, what's all the excitement? You break that guy and explain in a minute, Ed. No time. Mm. Good afternoon, Second National. Give me the manager on duty, please. Emergency. One moment, please. One moment. Come on, come on. I'm sorry, sir. The line is busy. Would you care to wait? Give me the chief teller. Thank you. Chief teller, Waters. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. Emergency call. Has the payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? Well, uh, I wouldn't know, Sergeant. Uh... Just a moment. I'll have your call switched. Yeah. Operator. Beatrice, would you give this call to Miss Chalmers? Uh, it's important. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers. What's the matter, Freddy? Are you sick? Yeah, I'm sick. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers is a sergeant, Friday, police department. Has a payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? From Brazier? Why, yes, not more than two or three minutes ago. And he had the payroll with him? Of course. Thanks. Got a tip on a payroll stick, Ben. You coming? Yeah, let's go. Ben, down this way. Coming. Let's hustle it. Down the stairs. Communications get the story. You got it on the air now. Where's this brazier coming in? Third and Spring, about five blocks from here. Come on. Here's the garage. All right, come on. Hit it. Let's make time. Get the radio on. Just warming up. Cars are closing in fast. Fourth Street up ahead, Ben. Might meet him at this end of Clay Alley. Hold on. No, looks pretty quiet at this end. Not much you can do without. Hey, hey, look. Coming out of the alley now. Guy with the police. Brown cloak. The guy with him. Pull up, Ben. 
Now, let's go. All right, you hold it. They're running for it. Come on. Ben, what's this button? Let's go. Come on, they're losing it. I see them up ahead. They're turning on the hill street. Romero, come on. Will you, Skipper? You see them, Joe? Heading for the subway terminal. Yeah, they're going into the crowd. Don't lose them. All right, I'll take the ramp to the left. Then go with him. I'll take the one to the right. You see him, Joe? No, I lost. Now, wait a minute. There they are. Over the turnstile. Come on. Joe. Joe, they're off the platform. They're crossing the track. That's not one of them. Come on. Over the turnstile. Come on, there. Joe, the other guy. He's down into the tunnel. He's free. Come on, after him. Hug the side. He's trapped, Ben. There's a train coming through. You, come back. You're trapped. Ben, get out. Hug the side. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, are you? Mm-hmm. You want to check? No, I don't think it's any use. Yeah. Well, let's go. I wonder why he tried so hard, Joe. I don't know, Ben. Some people are like that. You can blow the whistle all you want. They never know when to stop. <laughs> Frank Gannon, the only surviving member of the holdup gang, was tried and convicted of the crime of assault with intent to commit murder. He is now serving out his sentence at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 16th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Richard H. Taylor of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of December 13th, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. likes a great deal about the South. We like a great deal about Phil Harris. For instance, we like his beautiful blonde wife, Alice Faye. In fact, we like the Phil Harris-Alice Faye show, and it just happens that it returns to the NBC air tomorrow. Why don't you take our advice and listen to one of the funniest shows around anywhere? That's the Phil Harris-Alice Faye show tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. <laughs> Something's happened? Fifteen minutes after we left the coffee shop, we drove up in front of the gate of the Kelby Nursery on Belasco Road. The house itself was set well back on the property, which covered about four acres. The entire nursery was surrounded by a six-foot steel wire fence, and it looked like almost every available foot of ground inside was planted with some kind of a flower or shrub. Kelby met us at the gate. Yes? What do you men want? Police officers. Are you Mr. Kelby? Yes, what do you want? Well, if you'll shut those dogs up for a minute, we'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm busy now. Can't you come back tomorrow? Pretty important, Mr. Kelby. I think we better talk right now. All right, if you have to. Red, giant, down. You too, honey. Quiet. All right. Now, what do you want? Mind if we come inside? Well, these watchdogs of mine are pretty vicious. We can talk here at the gate. All right, Mr. Kelby. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We've been assigned to look into your wife's disappearance. Oh. Did you find anything yet? Nothing definite. Maybe you can help us. Would you tell us exactly what happened the night your wife disappeared? What do you mean, what happened? Well, when did you last see her? When did you first notice she was gone? We finished up Sunday night dinner about 7 o'clock, and I laid down for a nap. Agnes went out on the front porch for some air. 
Woke up a little before eight and went outside to look for her. She was gone. Nobody saw her leave, Mr. Kelby? Not that I know of. Maybe some of our nosy neighbors, I don't know. How about your stepson? Wasn't he around Sunday night? Bruce? No. Went out to a show. Some other kids. When did he get back from the show? About ten, I think. Why? Where's your stepson now? Who are you looking for, my wife or my stepson? Both, Mr. Kelby. Where's your stepson? Gone. I took him over to my sister's in Alhambra. Been feeling bad since his mother disappeared. Figured the change would do him good. When did you take him over to your sister's, Kelby? This afternoon. What's that got to do with it? We'd like to talk to Bruce. No, no, I can't allow it. The boy's too upset. I can't allow it. I'm afraid you're going to have to allow it. Listen, mister, you can get off this property right now. No cops giving me sass. Nobody's giving you sass, Kelby. We want to talk to your stepson, that's all. He might give us a clue as to the whereabouts of your wife. And I say you can't see the boy. What's more, you cops couldn't find thorns in a rose patch. I'll get somebody else to look for Agnes. It's my business anyway. Nobody else's. It's our business, too, if anything's happened to her. What are you talking about? You better get your coat, Mr. Kelby. We're taking in for questioning. <laughs> You come through that gate, and I'm going to let these dogs go accidentally. I'd hate to shoot the dogs. Now go on in the house and get your coat. Harry Kelby turned and made his way up the path and into the house. Five minutes later, he came out. Without a word to either of us, he came down the path, closed the gate behind him, and got into our car. On the way back to headquarters, he chatted pleasantly about the weather, the nursery business, and his dog. When we pulled up in front of the city hall, we met the reason for his sudden change in temperament. His lawyer was waiting for us at the door. We took Kelby to one of the interrogation rooms. His lawyer tagged along. We tried to question him, but the lawyer objected to two out of every three questions we asked. It was hopeless, and we knew it. So did the lawyer. We released Kelby, but we did get the name and address of his sister where the stepson Bruce was staying. After they left, Ben and I got back in the car and drove out to Alhambra to check on the boy. Forget he had this and pegged right, Joe. It's a real sleeper. Yeah. I'd like to know how the stepson missed that date with us this afternoon. Well, if the kid called us from the house, his stepfather could have overheard him. It's possible. Sister's house ought to be along this block, shouldn't it? Yeah, let's see. 1408, 1406. All right, it's your great cottage, 1402. Right. That's a nice-looking little place, isn't it? Well kept. Yeah, it's a nice neighborhood. I wonder how the lot prices run out here. Somebody's coming. Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. Are you Miss Kelby? Bertha Kelby, yes, that's my name. Why? We talked to your brother earlier today, Miss Kelby. He said that you brought his stepson, Bruce, here to stay for a while. We'd like to see him. Bruce? Yes, he was here till about, oh, an hour and a half ago. I went to the store, and when I came back, he was gone. Have you any idea where he might be, Miss Kelby? Well, I telephoned my brother Eric's place just before you came to the door. He's not there. I don't know where he might be. I'm worried about him. He seems so upset. This business about his mother's disappearance, you know. Do you mind if we came in and looked around, Miss Kelby? Well, no, not at all. We went in and looked the house over from one end to the other. There wasn't a trace of the boy. We drove back to Kelby's nursery and satisfied ourselves the boy wasn't there. Then we came back to Alhambra and we kept an eye on Miss Bertha Kelby's home until midnight. No one came or went. At five minutes past midnight, the lights went off in the living room and a few minutes later in the back of the house. The next morning, when Ben and I checked in for work as usual at 8 o'clock, we met with Captain of Homicide, Frank Kearney. What makes you two so positive there has been any foul play in this Kelby thing? That's just it, Cap. We're not positive. It's a whole setup. It smells bad. For instance? That lawyer. If a man's innocent, he doesn't need a lawyer to sit with him in the interrogation room and tell him not to answer questions. Number two, that kid's telephone call. Maybe he doesn't get along with his stepfather. It happens, you know. Maybe he's trying to get back at him for something or other. Maybe. Then why is Kelby hiding him out? You sure he's hiding him out? No other way to take it, Cap. <laughs> the Kelby woman walked away from her home Sunday night. Nobody saw her. She took nothing with her. No clothes, no luggage, no money. You checked with the family doctor. Yesterday. He told us Mrs. Kelby was in perfect health. We double-checked the wanderer's file and the repeater's file and missing persons. Couldn't find her name in either one. How about her relatives in town? I haven't had a chance to talk to them yet, Cap. We'll check them this morning. Well, one thing's certain. The woman couldn't have gone very far. We checked the sheriff's office, the jails, the hospital. Could have sent out a teletype and an APB. Every cop in the city has her description. She's been gone almost four days, but nobody's seen her. How does that add up to you? It doesn't. You better move on it. Check every one of Mrs. Calby's friends and relatives. Right, Frank. Then try the neighbors. As long as I've been a cop, neighbors have been able to tell everything about anyone.
All that day, Ben and I made the rounds. First stop was the Western National Bank, where Mrs. Kelby maintained her account. Her savings statement showed a total balance of $31,564.17. Her separate checking account had a balance of $842.71. At the Farmers Mutual, we found the record of an insurance policy issued to Agnes Trumbull Kelby. It was a 20-pay life policy covering the insured in the amount of $30,000. The beneficiary was listed as the insured son, Bruce Trumbull Kelby, if living upon the receipt of such due proof. If not, the insured's husband, Eric J. Kelby. By the time we finished checking her financial status, the odds were piling up fast. From only casual reports, we knew that Eric Kelby was a frugal man. If he was greedy as well, if he wanted and needed money badly enough to kill, then he had all the motives necessary to murder his wife. Maybe his stepson, too. Ben and I started to make the rounds of Mrs. Kelby's friends and relatives. Our first stop was at the apartment of Agnes Kelby's sister, a talkative maiden lady in her early 60s. Agnes just isn't that kind. Oh, I'm worried sick about this. I really am. And Bruce, the poor lad, he must be heart sick. And Eric, what does Eric say about all this? He says he thinks his wife left him. Left him? Why, that's ridiculous. How strange. Can you think of any good reason why your sister would leave Mr. Kelby? I? Why, no. They had tiffs, of course, small ones. But, of course, there was that argument about Bruce. The two of them always seem to be arguing about Bruce. How do you mean, ma'am? Oh, well, raising the boy and all, you know. Last time I talked to them, they were tipping about whether or not Bruce should be paid for working in the nursery for Eric. And the strangest thing, Eric seemed to be so upset about it all. Imagine. All on account of paying the boy a few dollars for good, honest work in that silly nursery. Well, you know, I'm the outspoken kind, and I just told Eric. Eric, I said, don't be an old meanie. Pay the boy. That was the extent of the information which Mrs. Kelby's sister had to offer. Next, we called on an aunt, a Mrs. James D. Trumbull, 83 years old. She could hardly understand our questions, let alone answer them. She hadn't seen her niece, Agnes, in a year. After that, we paid a visit to one of Mrs. Kelby's friends, a Mrs. Lillian Humboldt. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but I can't think of any good reason why she would leave him. Unless that silly business about Bruce got out of hand. You know, maybe Eric is just a little jealous of the boy. Next, we called on Daisy McLeod, who worked as a day maid for Mrs. Kelby. Officer, what Mr. and Mrs. Kelby thought, what they said, what they did, it's none of my business. I come in the morning, I do my work, I do it well. I'm not the nosy type and I don't pry. I take half an hour for lunch and when I'm through, I take my pay and I don't expect tips and I take the bus home. I'm not the peeking through the keyhole kind, sneaking around corners listening. But what I couldn't tell you about that man. Exactly what do you mean, Miss McLeod? Oh, he's a hard man, you know. They're always arguing about the boy. Bruce this, Bruce that. He's a nice boy, I think. He's never done anything to me. Oh, but the arguments. Him and her all the time. Should the boy be paid for working? Shouldn't he? Why? Why not? When Ben and I finished with a list of Mrs. Kelby's friends, relatives, and employees, we started out on the neighbors. None of them saw Mrs. Kelby after 6 p.m. the night she disappeared. Two of the neighbors said they saw the porch light burning after 7 p.m., but both said the porch was empty. Mrs. Kelby was not sitting in her chair at the usual time after dinner. According to them, that was one of her habits. It was 10 minutes to 6 by the time Ben and I got back to the office. The light was still burning in Captain Kearney's office. Full day, Joe. Not a mile. Yeah. I wonder what the captain's hanging around for. Let's find out. Get anything? Pretty good luck, Cap. Yeah. Good. I've got some more for you. Just walked in five minutes ago. What do you mean, Frank? Who walked in? Bruce Kelby. He's waiting in the next room. We went in the next room and met Bruce Kelby. He was small for a 17-year-old, dark-haired and a little on the sickly side. He told us that he couldn't keep the date he made with us on the phone because his stepfather apparently did overhear the conversation and drove him directly to his sister's home in Alhambra. We asked him why he was so sure that his stepfather was responsible for his mother's sudden disappearance. For one thing, all three of us usually go to the early show on Sunday night. Eric, Mom, and me. But last Sunday, Eric said he wasn't feeling good and he wanted Mom to stay home and take care of him. Then he told me to go on ahead to the show, so I did. What time did you get home, son? About 9.30, quarter to ten. Mm, what was your stepfather doing when you got home? Sitting in the living room, reading the paper. You notice anything unusual about the way he acted? He was nervous and jumpy, more than usual, I think. Anything else? Yes, sir. When I came in through the front yard, I noticed the dogs had mud all over their paws. They'd been out somewhere in the nursery plots. 
And they won't go out in the pots unless Eric's with them. He doesn't want them to trample the seedlings. What would your stepfather be doing out in the nursery at night? Does he usually do some work at night? No, sir. None of the plots are even lighted. Only the greenhouses. And the paths in the greenhouses are usually graveled, aren't they? No mud around. It's my job to see that the greenhouse paths are kept graveled. I know they're not muddy. I, I fixed them the day before, Saturday. What do you think it means, son? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to think about it. I, I just know he's done something. He's done something to her. Did your stepfather give you any reason for keeping you away from the police officers the other day? No, sir. He said people were getting nosy, and he said it might be better for me over at Aunt Bertha's. She's his sister. Do you think your Aunt Bertha might know where your mother is? No, we hardly ever see her. We don't know her well at all. We've heard your mother and your stepfather argued about whether you should be paid for your work in the nursery. When I started to work for him, he promised he'd pay me. I was saving up to buy a 31 Model A. And then after a couple of months, when he didn't pay me, I asked him. He told me I ought to be glad to work for him for nothing. And your mother argued with him over that? Sure. It was her money that bought the nursery anyway. How'd you get away from your aunt's place last night? Well, Bertha had some shopping to do, and she left me alone. She locked the door to my room. Even the screen over the window in my room was nailed down, but I kicked it out and got away. I uh, stayed at a friend's house last night. You thought about where you're going to stay tonight? I don't know. But I'm not going home, and I'm not going back to Bertha's place either. I'll get a room. How'd you like to stay at my house a few days? Sure nice of you, sir. Maybe I'd better not. Mom might not like it. Oh, I'll take care of that. Now, let's hop out and get some dinner. Sure darn nice of you, sir. All right, son. Come with me. What do you think, Joe? He could be lying. Yeah. <laughs> Now what, Cat? Shall we bring Kelby in again? No, not yet. He's found out by now from his sister that the boy's gone. He probably figures the police station is the first place he'd come. Wouldn't do much good pulling him in now, Ben. We couldn't even question him. Ten to one, his lawyer would be waiting for us when we got back. That's the problem. How do we get to this Kelby without his lawyer finding out? Well, what about the early morning, Cap? Say tomorrow, about 5 or 6 a.m. Think he'd be looking for us then? Yeah, that might do it. We can just get by that pack of hounds he owns... Without waking the whole neighborhood. Might work. If we could just question him alone. I've got an idea it wouldn't take much to make him cop out. All right, give it a try. Get out there in the early morning and bring him in for questioning as quietly as possible. I'll be in at 6 a.m. If you want me before then, call me at home. All right, Frank. Kelby's got a smart lawyer. It's going to be plenty hard to convict him without a body and corroborating evidence. He's got four acres out there, Cap. You can hide a lot of bodies in four acres. Well, that's what I mean. This case isn't ending. It's just beginning. The next morning, Ben and I met at the office about a few minutes past 4 a.m. We had a cup of coffee and a donut at an all-night restaurant, and then we started for the Kelby place out on Belasco Road. We took four pounds of fresh horse meat with us to keep the dogs quiet if they raised a fuss. It was 28 minutes past 4 when Ben pulled the car to a stop a few hundred feet from the gate to the Kelby nursery. got out of the car and made our way down the road to the gate. I reached in and tried the latch. It was padlocked. The dog started in. Okay, Ben, looks like we'll have to jump the fence. Toss some of that horse meat over to him. Yeah, yeah, here. That's it. Come on, let's climb. Keep an eye on those hounds. Looks like they could chew your leg off. Yeah. Here comes the third one, Ben. Toss some more meat. Yeah, there you are, boy. Go get it, go get it, boy. Look, Ben, light's going on in the house. Come on, let's make it fast. Who is it? Who's there? I'll set the dogs on you. Police officers, Mr. Kelby. What? What are you doing out here this time of night? You're under arrest, Kelby. Get your coat. You cops are asking for a peck of trouble. Get your coat. Where's my stepson? What have you done with him? What have you done with your wife? You're going to pay for this. I'll have your jobs. That's not the first time we heard that, Kelby. Let's go. Lights burning in the captain's office. Yeah. All right, Kelby, in here. I'm pay for this. Mark my word. Ben, take him in the office here and stay with him. I'll see if Frank's in yet. All right, Joe. Come on, Kelby, inside. Friday? 
Did you bring in Calby? He's down in the interrogation room. Ben's with him. Somebody saw you. Don't think so. They must have. Calby's lawyer is sitting in the next room. Calby again refused to answer any questions without the advice of his attorney. We released him. That day, Captain Kearney sent out two men to keep an eye on the nursery and report on all of Kelby's movements. Shortly after 7 o'clock that night, just after nightfall, we tried once again to bring in Kelby for questioning without his lawyer's knowledge. It didn't work. A little after we booked him, his lawyer obtained a writ of habeas corpus. We had to release him again. The two men assigned to stake out the Kelby place reported definitely that somebody was tipping the lawyer whenever unknown visitors showed up at the nursery and drove off with Kelby. There was nothing we could do about it. Next morning, Kearney came up with a lead. I had a long talk with the boy last night. Accidentally, I think he's given us a pretty good lead. Yeah? There's only one way we'll ever get a conviction. That's by finding the body and evidence to tie Kelby in. Yeah, that'll do it. Where do we start looking? In a new rose bed next to one of the greenhouses in Kelby's nursery. Hmm? The kid came up with it last night. How come? First, Kelby's crazy about saving a dollar and making one. Yeah. In the nursery trade, especially where you have a limited area to work in, like Kelby... You cultivate every foot of ground. Every bit of soil you've got is planted with something. Mm -hmm. Kelby's not the type to waste anything. Especially he's not the kind that would let ground life fallow when he could plant something that might bring in a few dollars next season. Bruce tells me his stepfather has every inch of those four acres planted. Every inch. Except a six-by-nine-foot plot of ground in that rose garden. Well, that sounds like a long shot to me, Frank. The boy said he prepared that piece of ground for planting late Saturday afternoon. His stepfather wanted it ready for Sunday morning. The plot of ground's still vacant. Might have planted it yesterday, Cap. When's the last time you checked? Mm, before I came to work this morning. I called the men on stake out next to the nursery. They told me the plot's still empty. Mm -hmm. It's worth a chance, Frank. When do we look it over? Tonight. I don't want Kelby or his lawyer to know a thing until we find that body. Well, how are we going to work it? We'll order up a crew from the crime lab. They can take probings through that plot and all around it. They can tell us without any guesswork how deep that ground's been worked over lately. When do you want to start? Be here in the office at 8.30 tonight. If my hunches are any good, we'll find the body. It was ten minutes past nine that night when we got to the Kelby place. Lieutenant Lee Jones and his assistants, Kearney, Ben, and two other men from Homicide. The men on stakeout told us that Kelby had left about 20 minutes before in a dark blue coupe. Ben brought along the usual supply of horse meat for the dogs so we didn't have any trouble there. We found the empty plot of ground in the rose bed next to the greenhouse, exactly as Bruce described it to Kearney. Ground's been worked over all right, boys. At least four to five feet down. All right, Lee, let's start digging. Romero, take care of the dogs. Watson, grab one of these shovels. Right, Captain. Hey, mm. you ever said these dogs were vicious, didn't you? Yeah, why? Look at these hounds. They're no more vicious than a lively cold, huh? Higgins, get that light over here, will you? Thanks. What is it, Lee? Let me see. Teeth. A set of false teeth. Been in the ground long? Don't think so, judging from the shape they're in. How far down would you say, Yarley? A couple of feet. Ground's real soft. Lee, come here a minute. What is it? Body. Here's a shoulder. All right, you men over here with Watson. Get the dirt off the face. Romero, you got a picture of the Kelby woman? Yeah, Captain. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Thanks. Get the light down here. Hunch paid off, Frank. That's her. Ben and I went back to the car and notified communications to broadcast a want for murder on Eric Kelby. His description, together with the description of the car and license number of the car he was driving, was rebroadcast every 15 minutes. Then we went back to check the house. We found the front door unlocked. We went inside and looked around. In one bedroom, we found clothes scattered over the bed and the floor. There was only one old suit remaining in the closet. On the table next to the bed, we found an airline's timetable. We got to the phone and notified communications to alert all police details at railroad stations, bus terminals, and airlines, and then to send out an APB on the teletype. After that, we checked with the airlines. One of them told us that a man answering Kelby's description had booked passage for Mexico City. The plane was scheduled to take off at 10.40 that night from Burbank Airport. Ben's watch said four minutes past ten. We called the detail at the airport and alerted them. Then we drove over to check in person. It was 10.35 p.m. when Ben and I took up our positions just inside gate three, where passengers were boarding flight 72 for Mexico City. He's cutting it close, Joe. Got about four minutes more to get flying. We waited. The crowd got thicker as departure time came closer. 
At 10.39, Eric Kelby came through the main entrance, across the terminal, through gate three, into a pair of handcuffs. Ah, I don't understand. What does this mean? We found your wife's body, Kelby. What? I don't know what you're talking about. In the rose patch next to the greenhouse. Your lawyer can't help this time. Mexico City. Would have been a nice trip. Expensive. I'll plead insanity. I didn't know what I was doing. Be a nice vacation next year, Joe, Mexico City. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I didn't mean it. She slapped me. We were arguing about the boy. I didn't mean it. I don't know if you did or not, Kelby, but you killed her. Come on. You missed your plane. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Eric Kelby was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He is now awaiting execution in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 14th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W. Show, usually heard at this time, has moved to a new time period on Sunday nights. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Armin on the new Pet Milk Show tomorrow night on NBC. And now, here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man's wife has suddenly dropped from sight. On the surface, it appears only as a routine missing persons case. You start to investigate. Suspicion grows. There is evidence of possible foul play. Your job, find the woman or find her murderer. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, September 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from lunch, and it was 12.56 when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Waiting for you. Hiya, Ben. Al. Hi. I hear you got something for us. Uh, here's a report right here. A gardener by the name of Eric Kelby called in the day before yesterday. He said his wife disappeared from their home out in the valley Sunday night. He says he thinks she left him. Well, that happens every day, Bargetti. Uh, not this way, it doesn't. Uh, Walsh and I went out yesterday to interview the guy. The story doesn't add. Why not? Well, none of her clothes are missing. None of her luggage. She even left her pocketbook behind, full of money. Found out from the neighbors a missing woman is a 17-year-old boy by a former marriage. So what? An only child. Mother dotes on the kid. Shouldn't even say goodbye to him. How did this Eric Kelby impress you? Pretty grouchy with Walsh and me. No cooperation. Wants to find his wife, doesn't he? I don't know if he does or not. It's no help, I'll tell you that. Can I see that report a minute now? Oh, here you are. Agnes Trumbull Kelby, age 39. Kelby's her second husband. The first one died a little after the boy was born. Mm -hmm. Disappeared Sunday night from her home, 546 Belasco Road, between 7 and 8 o'clock. When did Kelby call in? Monday afternoon. Said he thought his wife might be spending the night with her sister. When he found out she wasn't, he called us. Did you meet the boy while you were out there, Borgay? Yeah, that's another thing. Kid came riding in on a bike while we were talking to one of the neighbors. Trying to talk to him, but the old man came out hustling him inside the house. Then he starts eating us out. Hmm. What did he say? Told us it was our job to find his wife, not to go prying into his stepson's affairs. Well, that's a new slant. How about her friends and relatives around here, Al? Any besides his, her sister? Mm, Walsh located a couple of her aunts. I don't think he's checked them yet, though. I'll tell you, boys, this is one I'll bet on. Maybe. 
You got the names of Mrs. Kelby's relatives? Oh, yeah. yeah right over here. Sure wish we had a chance to talk to that boy. Yeah. How'd he feel? How's it feel to you, Ben? Mm, I don't know. Notice anything else funny about the guy, huh? Well, I don't know. Well, here's those names, Joe. Thanks. Kelby was upset, all right. For some reason, he didn't strike me as reacting the way a normal guy reacts when his wife disappears. All right, Al. How would you react? Mm-hmm. Forget he's worrying again. Oh, now listen, boys. It's no fooling matter. This is one I'll bet on. It's a homicide. All right. How about a copy of this report? Yeah, uh, where'll I get the phone? Missing person, Spaghetti. Who's that? Oh. Uh, yes. Yes. About what? Oh, sure. All right, sir. Four o'clock. Yeah. Goodbye. That was Kelby's stepson. What do you want? Think something's happened to his mother. <laughs> In police work, missing persons detail is not a department separate in itself. It is organized as a part of the Homicide Bureau. According to Bargetti, who took the call, the boy said he suspected his stepfather, and he didn't want him to know of any meeting between him and the police officers. He would meet the officers that afternoon at 4 p.m. in a restaurant on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Fairfax Avenue. At 3.15, Ben and I left the office and drove out to the meeting place, the Dairyland Fountain and Coffee Shop. We arrived there at 3.45. At eight minutes to five, the Kelby boy still had not arrived. Youngster's not very prompt. Well, let's wait a little while longer. Yeah. Smoke? Yeah, thanks. Want some more coffee? 